Um, I picked three topics. Um, I'll start very briefly with, you know, the last few years. Uh, I've been in the NBA for the last 24 years, uh, the last three years with the Minnesota Timberwolves. And then this past summer, uh, Yao Ming offered me uh, a position with the Chinese national team to coach in the world championships uh, as the lead assistant. I took that job over the summer. And then uh, when I got home, uh, I went back and uh, got a job with Perth Wildcats in the uh, NBL over in Australia and just got home a month ago uh, after winning the championship over there. So uh, like all of you, we're all kind of waiting to see what happens here, but this is a great opportunity for everyone to connect. Uh, the three things I was gonna talk about, I've seen some of the webs before, is a lot of basketball, you know, pick and roll defenses and such and offensive schemes. And what I thought I would do was do something maybe a little bit different to talk about being organized at this time. It's very rare that you have this much time on your hands as a coach, whether you're young or old. I think this is a great chance for you to start to organize some of your things moving forward. And I'll talk about three things. The first is just a general resume. I'll talk very briefly about that. I think most of you have my resume or at least a version of that. And then uh, I'll talk about a coaching philosophy, which I think is gonna be important for you. And then inside the coaching philosophy, there's a bunch of different topics. Uh, one of them that I'll talk about briefly is creating a defense uh, philosophy. So if we get started, uh, I think if you look at my resume, uh, the thing I want to bring out about that is, I think regardless of who you are, what level you've been coaching at, as long as your name isn't Popovich or Messina or Lasso or Ataman or Obradovich, everyone needs a resume. And you have to have that resume, I think, that has some kind of um, eye-catching things in it in order for you to possibly get a job or have this resume reviewed by other people. And if you see my resume, um, I've used this the last probably 10 to 15 years and just changed the format here and there. It's pretty straightforward as far as my team experience of what I've done year after year. Uh, then it goes into some professional things that I've done as a player. And then the last part, will highlight some of those things that I've done. And like I said, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I think it's really important that you have this organized, that it's something that's eye-catching so that when you are going for interviews, uh, people are going to read it and they're going to be interested in it as opposed to just a year-by-year -year kind of generic resume that doesn't have a lot of pop to it. Uh, you know, I put some photos in here. There's some background in there. You can do it any way you like but I think it's important that you have it, um, regardless of what you're gonna do, especially some younger coaches who may be thinking about coming to the United States um, at some point or another, who maybe think about coming to other countries to coach. They're gonna wanna know what your resume looks like and who you are. And more importantly, probably the person that's gonna write your check is gonna be the one that really wants to see that. I mean, ownership. You know, The general managers will always kind of know who you are, but ownership's gonna to wanna to have a quick look at what you've been doing and who you are. And I think if the resume looks good, it's uh, laid out properly, it can really help you get a job down the road. And again, this is something with our time we have now that we can go and start to do some of these things and get organized as a coach. So I would say one thing to start off with, start to organize your resume while you have time, while you have these times to uh, reflect on what you've done and maybe change it or tweak it a little bit to uh, uh, enhance your chances of getting a job. Like I said, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. I know most of you, if not all of you, have resumes, but I think it's important that um, it looks good when you do it. The second thing I think is really, for me, the most important thing I want to talk about is coaching philosophy. So um, over the last 10, 15 years, like all of us, you start to collect information on things that you like and don't like and what you would do and what you wouldn't do. But I don't know how many of you have actually wrote it down. And my assistants in the past, I've told them from day one that you, start, that you need to start having a coaching philosophy. And my coaching philosophy started probably 10 or 15 years ago with about 25 pages. It took me about a year to write. 
Now, I didn't do that every day, but I continually gathered my information, started coming up with ideas and topics, and what I wanted to be able to do, what my foundation is as a coach, and what my philosophy as a coach is. And I have it down to now about six pages. I send that everywhere uh, that needs to go with my resume. Um, it's easy to read. The topics are very simple and basic, which I'll talk about. You can obviously change those things. But again, I think this is a hugely important thing you're going to need as you start to create your own philosophies and jobs. The hard thing is, when I say coaching philosophy, most of you say, yeah, I'd like to do this. I'd like to play fast. Uh, I like to shoot a lot of threes. I like to trap the post. I don't like to trap the post. I like to trap the pick and roll. You might have a lot of ideas, but you need to have your core foundations of what you truly, truly believe in. And then over the course of time, you can always change your philosophy to add on what you like and what you don't like. The last four weeks, I've updated my resume since I've been home, and I've tweaked my coaching philosophy a little bit also, because you're always going to see new things. Within the coaching philosophy, I'll give you a few topics of what I talk about through my philosophy. Again, it started in a big 25 or so page thing that I shrunk to about six pages, seven pages that a general manager would read, ownership would want to read, and get an idea of who you are. You know, some of the topics I have in mind is how I view the game is one of my topics. So my philosophy of how I see today's basketball, the impact of other coaches that have coached that I've coached with. For example, I have Don Nelson in mind, who's been one of my mentors and I've coached with. Jerry Sloan is in there. And then um, I have some international coaches that I mentioned inside my philosophy. And so I have the impact of my coaches is another topic. Practices, what I believe in, how to practice, how I would structure a practice, game day routines what I expect daily from a game day routine, uh, what my coaching staff is going to look like, what I believe, what I need from a coaching staff, the kind of people I want around me. Those things are going to be important to me also within my resume, within my coaching philosophy. Training staff, my expectations for my training staff and what they're going to be doing and what their roles will be. Uh, analytics, which is also very big now in basketball. Uh, across the board, it might be more important or less important to you, but analytics is another topic in my coaching philosophy. Player development is another topic. How to develop younger players, what you position on that moving forward. Travel, how do you want to travel during the course of your season, or what do you believe in as far as travel? What kind of hotel food, those kind of things. Uh, family. What role does the family play? Are they allowed into your practices? Is the girlfriend of a, one of your players allowed to come watch a practice? Is a family member allowed to travel on the road? Those have to be part of your coaching philosophy and your beliefs. Uh, the big thing now is the PR department. Since we have now Twitter, uh, Facebook, all these things, what's your PR for your club? What is, what's your, what's your, your goal, what's your one voice that's being heard from the president, the general manager, the coach, and from your PR department. So that when I say something out in public, everyone is on the same page. How do you see that and how do you view that in your coaching philosophy about having a PR department, an owner, general manager, all on the same page? Uh, leadership this is another topic. How I lead, my personality, my beliefs again. And then obviously an offensive philosophy and a defensive philosophy. Those are just some of the topics within my sixes. Some of them are a paragraph, some of them are a little less, but there's something that you have that you're able to know, this is Scott Roth. When I read this, I understand who he is without even having to meet him first. And why I think it's so important to have a coach philosophy, especially now, is over the last few years time I've gotten the interview the reason I've gotten the job in my opinion is because of my coaching philosophy and I'll tell you why when you go to an interview they're going to look at your resume and tell you ask you a few questions 
if you don't have a coaching philosophy, the interviewer, the general manager, the owner, he controls the interview. He asks you all the questions and you have to respond to him. What has happened to me in the past is every time in my coaching philosophy, one thing always, always happens. They start asking me and reading it to me why I'm sitting in the interview. And so why I'm sitting in the interview, they're asking me things that I already know. Now I control the interview, not them. And so the coaching philosophy allows me to be very comfortable in the interview and allows me to get from point A to point B to the end of my interview. So I think it's really, really important that you have this philosophy, that it's something that you believe in, and that's something that you can hold in front of anyone and say, this is me. This is who I am. This is what I believe. And yes, it's going to change from year to year. You're going to hear other coaches. If you're a younger coach, it's going to change over time. If you're a little bit of an older coach, it might be this the way it is for you, and you have no problem with not changing it. I tend to change mine very little, but every year, just a little something that I might hear. So I think the resume and the coaching philosophy are two things why we have this time where we're down and not really in the gym and sitting at home to gather all the information we've had over the last few years, coaches, players, clinics, and start to create some of these things while you have some free time on your hand that are gonna allow you to improve yourself as a coach and actually at the end of the day, potentially get you a job. Like I said, the coaching philosophy for me has been very, very powerful. Uh, my last interview, for example, with the Minnesota Timberwolves was over three and a half hours long. And I'd say an hour and a half of it, it was just my coaching philosophy. They basically read it back to me and asked questions about it within there. And it became very easy in the interview to answer those questions back. And I think that'll happen to a lot of you if you have that with you and you have an opportunity to be in a situation while you're getting interviewed. So those are two things I think that are important. One of the things within there uh, is creating a defensive philosophy. You have an offensive philosophy and a defensive philosophy. I'm going to talk a little bit again about my decent defensive philosophy, some things that I put inside my coaching philosophy, and things that I believe in are my core foundations of what I believe in defense. So my defensive philosophy is very, very simple. It's called the fence, the yard, and the house. The fence, the yard, and the house. Now everyone knows there's a fence that sits on the outside of your house. Then there's a garden or a yard that's inside that fence, and then your house. So here's my philosophy, coaching-wise on defense. I'm going to make you play off the fence, meaning I'm going to run you off the fence as a defensive coach. I'm going to make you play in my yard and take contested twos, and I'm not going to let anyone in my house. That's my coaching philosophy. Run the offensive players to shoot threes off the three-point line, which is the fence. Anything between the three-point line and the house or the key is the yard. I'm going to make you play in that yard and take contested twos because analytically, that is the toughest shot and the worst shot you can take in basketball. And I don't want you in my house. That's my coaching philosophy on defense. But now I have to break that down and what else I believe. And you're going to have to have drills to back that up. And I think Marat might have also sent this forward. But this is something that's in my office. It's on my board. It is basically my practice for the 2018-2019 season. That's it for my defense. So every time when I come in to have practice, I'm going to take – these drills that I believe in, that I've fine-tuned with my assistant coaches, they know their roles within these drills, how we're going to run them. And when I need something during the course of practices or the season, they're right there on the board for me. I don't have to look any farther. This is what I believe in. These are the drills I believe in. And these are what I'm going to teach you. 
And so my defensive philosophy reflects my drills. So again, it's very easy to say, I'll write a coaching philosophy. It's hard. It's very easy to say, well, I have a defensive philosophy. Well, that's even harder because everyone says something, but do you actually do it? Do you actually have the foundation to do it? Do you actually have the drills to do it? Players are going to change. The personnel of your team is going to change. But what is the core foundation? Mine is the fence, the yard, the house. Run them off the fence, make them play in the yard, nobody in the house. To expand on that, I have a few other things that are just core rules of my defense. The first one is a squared stance. I don't believe in forcing the ball left or right. I believe in having a squared stance on the basketball. And if you have a strong driver that's left or right, you shade a half a body. That's my belief. So when I play one-on-one -on -one defense, the number one thing I'm asking you to do is in a squared stance on the basketball. The other things I believe in is what I call the 80-20 rule. The 80-20 rule is if there's a player in the corner of the floor that's a very good shooter, you know defensively that your rule is the 80-20 rule. 80%, I'm guarding my man. 20%, I'm in a help position. So that when I have a player in that position, my defense already knows I'm in the 80-20 rule. I'm never going to stop a ball on a wing penetration and leave the corner for an open three. It's the 80-20 rule. Now, if you're playing the Golden State Warriors and it's Steph Curry in the corner or Clay Thompson, it might be 99%, 1%. But the general rule for me and my foundation is the 80-20 rule. Another rule for me within my coaching philosophy and defensive philosophy is going to be there's four areas that you cannot catch the ball comfortably. Our players know it. The staff knows it. There's four areas you are not allowed to catch the ball comfortably without confrontation, without a battle. That's both boxes and both elbows. Those four areas, part of my foundation is you cannot catch the ball there comfortably. You have to be forced out, off the box, off the elbows, somewhere other than where you want to catch it. Another rule of mine, and I won't go through all of them, but I have about eight or nine of them that are in this foundation, is the three bump rule. Any big that runs down the floor that is running to the rim or to the post and he gets below the three-point line, he automatically gets bumped three times before he can catch the ball. It's, the, uh, it's a rule that all of our bigs know. Three bumps, get him off his spot, and defend him. A big is not allowed to run to the rim and seal you, run to the box and seal you. You do all your work before that. These are some of the philosophies that are inside my coaching philosophy. But for you, they might be different, which is fine. But you're going to have to write something down or believe in something that creates your foundation. You notice I haven't talked anything about a pick and roll or how to guard horns or how to guard a pin down. I'm just talking about general philosophies of what I believe in, and you might be completely different. You might want to send the ball to the sideline and change your stance. You might want to uh, trap certain things or rotate differently. But that's your foundation of what you need to have in your coaching philosophy. Those are just a few things that I think are going to be important for especially younger coaches to start developing and thinking about. You know, what are you going to do in transition in a pick and roll? What's going to be your coverages? How are you going to guard a certain player that shoots the ball behind the three-point line in transition? What are your rules? What are your rules versus a horn set or a floppy set? Those are all things, in my opinion, that you have to have the foundation and the belief that this is how we're going to guard it. Now, some of it obviously could be personnel-based, depending from one team to another. But my foundation of running them off the fence, making them play in my yard, and no one in my house, you can't catch the ball in the four areas. You have to be in a third stance, the A rule out of the corner, the three bump rule in transition, 
That's always. That doesn't change by anything. That's just what I believe in. So as you go forward, I think it's gonna be very important to make sure that you understand these things. But more importantly, I go back to this, is you're gonna to have to have drills and beliefs that you can mirror what you're teaching these players. You have to sell the players on what you're teaching them. And if you have the drills already out, then you know your philosophy is gonna follow these drills. So with these drills, I always have three or four that I'm gonna do every practice that are standard, that I do everything. Close out drills, some kind of shell drill, uh, probably some kind of rebounding drill and some kind of transition drill and a pick and reel drill. And then I'm gonna add anything that I need going into the week from this list here. If I need something for a team that's uh, playing a certain way or something that we didn't do in our last game, I'll go to my board with these drills and they're gonna have an answer for me. Oh, I see this drill. We'll use this this week because it's going to work uh, against Fenerbahce or it's going to work against FS. So that is my standard defensive philosophy. It's pretty basic, but at the end of the day, again, it's what you believe in and what, what works. Um, I'll give you another example of just a philosophy. When I was at the Toronto Raptors, my first year, I was in charge of the personnel um, offense and defensive stuff. And then uh, that season we had Andre Bignani, we had Calderon, we had Amir Johnson. We had, you know, not such a good team. DeMar DeRozan was a rookie and we were terrible defensively. We ranked number 30th in the league, 30th in all categories. The second year I was there, I became the defensive coach and we got in the top 10 of every category. And it was all because of one, one thing. We went from a blue stance in the pick and roll, meaning sending the ball down to the wing or down to the baseline, to a squared stance. So what we did is Jose Calderon, who I know a lot of you are familiar with, a great player, especially years ago, but not great athlete, not great foot speed. He was always in a blue stance, always sending the ball to the sideline, always sending the ball to the baseline. But the problem was he could never catch back up to the ball. And Westbrook and Kyrie Irving and everyone just kept driving by him, John Wall, and you never got back to him. So we started this thing, one thing, Jose, just stay in a square stance, and we're going to send the ball back to the middle of the floor. Now, again, a philosophy change from sending the ball from one side of the floor and keeping it there to the middle of the floor. But what it did, and it did it across the board for everyone, is when we went to a squared stance, we gave up a lot of easy baskets the first year, but the second year with the square stance, we took away all the straight line drives, all the quick penetrations, all the pick and rolls we couldn't get back in front of, and we kept the ball just in front of us. And so we eliminated 10, 12, 15 points a night by just being square on the basketball. Again, that's a philosophy thing. Doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It's just what we did. Something that I believe in is staying square on the ball. The last thing I want to talk about with this, and we'll get into some questions for you, is to end this all with the defensive philosophy is how important the video work is. Especially assistant coaches and, and uh, head coaches, it's extremely important that you're able to take your practices and hopefully you can video. Not everyone has the equipment, but hopefully you can video from your practices, obviously, to your games, and be able to have the responsibility of reinforcing what you're teaching. And whether it's offensively or defensively, we happen to be talking about defense, it's hugely important that the players are able to see the good and the bad, and that you're very honest with them on what we're trying to do and what we're looking for, and to reinforce your coaching philosophy, what you believe in, are you doing those things? Are you in the square stance? Did you run them off the three-point line? Did we contest the two? Did we let them drive into our paint? Did we let them catch on the elbow? If they're doing the things that you don't believe in, you're gonna to have to reinforce those. And video, to me, um, is just critical in the growth of any player. I've been lucky 
very, very lucky to have Paul Gasol when he was a rookie, Dirk Nowitzki when he was a rookie, Steve Nash in his second year, uh, Valanchunas in his first year, um, Steph Curry in his first year. And I'm telling you, you can teach them all you want during the course of a, a game and help them there. But really, when you start to break things down and see video with their players, depending, no matter what level they're at, the really good players want to see themselves and get better. So make sure that when you're doing these philosophies and coming up with your drills, that you're reinforcing them through video. It's going to be the only way that you can keep your checks and balances and holding the players accountable. And the video to me is, you know, very, very crucial in this whole process. Um, I know we only have 40 minutes and we kind of got about 10 more minutes left here, but I just want to review really quickly. Uh, I know this is kind of not the typical uh, basketball clinic where you're actually talking about plays and sets and things, but I just want to make sure that again, that, you know, the resume thing that we've talked about, that you're on point with that, that you're organized, that it looks good, uh, that it's eye catching, that it's uh, something that you're proud of that you can turn in that's going to help you get a job at the end of the day. And then again, with this downtime, are you able to write down your coaching philosophy? You know, don't be one of those guys that gets an interview and says, yeah, we'd like to talk with you and bring you in. By the way, can you send us our coaching philosophy? And you don't have one. And then, you know, you got four or five days before your interview, and now you're trying to write a coaching philosophy in five days. So, again, the coaching philosophy to me is the key of getting a lot of different types of jobs um, moving forward. But more importantly, it really helps you in the interview process because most, if not all, will start to tell you about asking questions within your own coaching philosophy. And then the defensive philosophy, I just went over briefly a few things that are in my defensive philosophy, what I believe in, what I teach no matter where I am. Again, I didn't talk about pick and roll coverage. I didn't talk about pin downs those type of things, transition defense, but I have some beliefs that I hold true that I'm going to always have with me um, of all the things I've seen over the years. And then the last one we just talked about is the videos. And, you know, again, reinforcing your drills, your practices, uh, anything that has to do with holding players accountable and making sure that your vision is being portrayed right to them. And it's critical that your coaching staff is on top of that, that they're on the same page with you, that they're organized and knowing the drills and knowing what you're seeing and just don't assume that the coach, assistant coach knows what you're talking about. And in the past, you know, with some of my coaches, we walk through the drills before the practice, the night of the, in the next practice, we'll walk through the drills as coaches and talk about them um, to make sure that we're on point and that we're all saying the same thing to keep these guys accountable. So. I hope this has been helpful. I know that, like I said, uh, we're all kind of struggling with things to do. And now that you do have some downtime, uh, I think it's a great time to really get organized across the board, no matter what level you're at, a young coach to an older coach, uh, and review some things and get organized. Marat, is there anything that uh, you'd like to ask or any questions? Uh, Scott Avi, uh, I changed our uh, plan in zoom so we have 90 90 oh. so uh i couldn't Good. mention i didn't mention to you but uh if you try to keep explaining you yeah you well let's uh, let's uh, maybe ask some questions and then i can keep going how about that okay it's it is great it's uh kim said erdem uh erdem mikrofonu açık sorar mısın uh hello coach Yes. This is Erdem, Erdem Can. First of all, thank you very much for um, being over here and sharing your uh, all experience and ideas. But I, I, I have one question that sure. the, the thing that you mentioned about writing down the principles, uh, how much you changed the, the, the first day you write down your uh, principles yes. and coming up to today, how much your absolutes, let's say absolutes, like squaring yes. up on on on one on one defense or eighty yeah. twenty principle, yes. how much you changed that, or the first day was like this and you kept going on that? Yes, it's a great question. Um, I think the first thing is yes. Over over time, I've I've changed some things and added things. It might be something that I saw 
a travel, uh, uh, how a team travels. Uh, for example, I just left Perth in Australia and I added something that I saw from this team of how they uh, have their players prepared in the mornings. Uh, they do some very unique things. And so I added that to my philosophy. Uh, so it does change, but I think the base of your philosophy is always going to kind of say the same if you have those topics and you can always add them or move them down. And as you grow as a coach and, you know, I go from Don Nelson to Iden Sivush to Iden Oris to uh, Herb, uh, Hubie Brown to Larry Brown, all these coaches have influenced me. And so, yeah, you're going to change or you're going to see other things. I just got back from China and being around Yao Ming, I learned some things just by being around Yao Ming. So, it changes, but it doesn't change a lot for me, to be honest with you, over the course of the last few years. Um, I think if you're really young and starting, it's probably going to change more. Mm -hmm. um, but defensively, those things that I mentioned about the square stand, those have been with me for 10, 15 years. I just don't, um, I just don't see it any other way and where I feel comfortable coaching and what I believe in. Mm -hmm. I think those are key things, and they're just going to be me. They're just who I am. And if you're coached by me, those are going to be your expectations. And yes, some of that might change. For example, we talked about being squared on the pick uh, on playing defense. And a lot of people get a little crazy with that. They're like, oh my gosh, you know, you're not sending the ball mm -hmm. one way. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so what do you do in a pick and roll? In a squared stance, in my opinion, there's only two times you change your feet, your angle. Mm -hmm. That's it. If I guard the ball for 40 minutes, which you wouldn't, if you guarded half that time, you're going to be square. The only time you're going to change your feet is in a pick and roll. Mm -hmm. So depending on what pick and roll coverage you have, you're going to change your feet to send the ball either down to the baseline or back to the mm -hmm. middle. Mm -hmm. and the second time you're only going to change your feet on a square stance is if someone basket cuts on you to force them in a different direction. Mm -hmm. Everything else is going to be squared to the basketball. Now, if you have a very strong right-hand driver, let's say, and you want to really send him to his left, we just take a half a body on the stance. Mm -hmm. But we try to stay as square as possible. Is it going to happen all the time? No. Are people going to change their feet? Yes. But over the course of time, hopefully we're going to cut down on some of the straight-line drives, some of mm -hmm. the easy baskets. Some of the situations where one on one you're guarding the ball and it's just you and him, and you're trying not to have any help, and you have to man up and play your guy. So, I really like the squared stance, I think it's brought a lot of values to the teams I've had. It's been hard at times to change people's ideas of that, but once you start holding them accountable through the videos, uh, through your actions, through your drills. Uh, I think it becomes very beneficial. For me, it's been very beneficial. Mm -hmm. Coach, thank you very much. Just related with this, one more small question about sure. uh, your structure. Um, I mean, mindset. Sure. Uh, the case that you, you want to use the square stance on one-on-one -on -one yes. situation, it's not related who your big man is, right? You will, you will stick with your principle. Let's say, it de yes. is it yeah, depending so on, on your, on your recreation or not? When I played... Uh, for the Utah Jazz, yeah. we were a blue team that sent the ball to Mark Eaton. We had a big seven foot five center, and that's mm -hmm. where we sent the ball. Mm -hmm. um, with me, I just think the players are now so versatile and so good mm -hmm. that um, guarding the ball one on one to me has become maybe the most important thing that you have to have to think about. You have to think about closing out do that every day in practice about being able to contain the ball and how you're going to guard the ball one on to keep it out of your paint and get into rotations mm -hmm. and so this again the squared stance to me has been the best option uh, when you start sending the ball in a certain direction it obviously can be very effective but it also can open up a lot of other issues too yeah. and most of the players now um, in general there's very few great big post players that are just dominant defensive guys. You know, everyone now is playing on the perimeter. You know, the Houston Rockets have ruined basketball because <laughs> everyone stands on the perimeter and no one knows how to play basketball anymore. Uh, so you don't have a big center to send them to. They just yeah. switch everything and play a different way. 
So um, for me, the square stance, uh, regardless of the size of the player that I would have in the post, um, doesn't matter. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Coach. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more question, Scott. Uh, yeah. Amit. Ahmet sorar mısın lütfen? Açtım hocam mikrofon şu an küçük olmuş. Uh oh, how do you get that Minnesota Timberwolves shirt? <laughs> Holy smokes! Bir an önce senin beğenmek. First of all, <laughs> thanks for joining us, coach. No uh, problem. As a diehard T-Wolves fan, I'm glad to have you here. <laughs> uh, I just have two quick questions. Sure. First of all, um, would you share your defensive concept or your master plan to stopping or slowing down the high pace speeds? Which is modern we call modern basketball nowadays yeah. and also what was it like to be a bowler in the late 90s i mean being on the court maybe guarding mj or something yeah uh well the first one's a you know a great question and you know uh what we're calling modern basketball you know again to me and it's just again my opinion i, I don't like it um i don't really necessarily believe in it um i think it's kind of ruined basketball to some degree of just shooting so many threes and uh, it's just not to me enjoyable I actually turn it off to be very honest with you and I've been in the NBA forever and there's just some teams I can't watch uh, but you have to play against them you have to guard them you have to, to deal with them and um, you know in transition is one of the biggest things I think coaches have to deal with in their philosophy of how you're going to guard the ball coming down in transition depending on the level of players you have Uh, there. And again, I've been, for example, with Coach Thibodeau when he was in Minnesota and when he's with the Chicago Bulls. He's a blue guy. He sends the ball to the baseline no matter what. He doesn't care who you are, what you're doing. If the ball gets to one side of the floor, he's sending the ball to the baseline. And that's his philosophy. And so it doesn't matter if the big's not quite in position, the guards know once I get the ball out of the middle of the floor, I'm sending the ball to the baseline, whether it's Russell Westbrook or an average guard coming down the floor. For myself, I've done both. I think you have to experiment a little bit, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but I go back again to the squared stance in transition. I try to get the ball and build a wall across the three-point line or hopefully just outside the three-point line. I like my bigs up at the level of the screen maybe a step or two behind. If it's a four man, maybe I have him as a show guy. Maybe he's a switch guy, depending on how good he is to move his feet. But I try to send the ball more towards the middle of the floor, higher, and I have my guards basically with a rule. You're either over or under, uh, depending. We have uh, in the NBA a 28-foot line mark that goes across the court, and that's kind of their rule. Uh, if it's above that 28-foot line, they can go over. If it's below the 28-foot line, they can go under. But we're trying to level the ball off flat and keep as much penetration away as we can and be able to guard one-on-one. -on -one. And I like our bigs up a little bit in that situation. Does it work? Not all the time. But, again, that's my philosophy in transition is being more of that kind of defense than sending a ball to the baseline um, where I think – Again, I go back to Jose Calderon. He was great at sending the ball in the right direction, but he could never get back and guard it. And it caused a lot of problems, and the ball continually got into the paint, which continually had other problems of opening up three-point shooters, and it just became very much of a problem. And once we got Jose back to square and all of our other players back to square, our defense, like I said, went from 30th to the top 10 in the NBA, and I, I just say it was just that one thing. Um, you know, I just watched, I think everyone's probably watched The Last Dance last night, and, you know, I actually sat with my daughter and watched it, and uh, it was kind of interesting because um, some of those people, like Charles Oakley uh, in that video, those are people I grew up with. He's lived, we, grew, we played basketball together since we were in seventh grade, and so to see some of the old highlights, uh, to reflect on some of the games, um, It was incredible. Um, but one of the ones was uh, with Minnesota. Our first um, uh, game with them, we played in the big old football stadium there. 
And uh, that was the expansion year of the Minnesota Timberwolves. And we had 45,000 people uh, at that game, 45,000. And then about two or three weeks later, uh, we played the Boston Celtics in there with Larry Bird and uh, McHale and Parrish. And we had 63,000 uh, at that game. And that year we broke the attendance record and we averaged over 30,000 a game uh, during that season. But uh, to play against Michael Jordan, uh, just an incredible honor to be around him. And, you know, like I told my daughter, I got to play against him and I actually coached against him uh, later on uh, when I got in the NBA and coached. So I got to see both sides of him and uh, just a spectacular player. And I think it's going to be great for sports to watch this over the next couple of weeks. Anything else, Amit? Thank you. <gülüyor> Thanks. Teşekkürler. Dersiniz. Ee, sorusu olan var mı? Okay. Uh, you can continue if you if you like. Yeah, I mean, I I think I, the the last couple of things I'll just add to that is um, player development. We can talk a little bit about that. Um, it's actually been one of the things that I've kind of been known for in the NBA. Um, and it's been more, I think, because of luck than anything else. But my first job uh, in the NBA as a coach was with Don Nelson with the Dallas Mavericks. And I got Dirk Nowitzki his rookie year. And then from there, um, it seemed like everywhere I went, I got a Hall of Fame player. I went there and then got Shane Battier, Pau Gasol, rookie years, Steph Curry in Golden State, um, Valanchunas in Toronto. and I dealt with basically developing bigger players, uh, even though I'm fat now. Um, I was very skinny when I played. I played, you know, the guard position basically when I was younger. Um, and obviously over in Turkey, I played everywhere. When I was with FS Pilsen, Aydin Suvish had me playing a one, the two, the three, the four, and the five. Um, but I got known as a, a big man's coach. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, I think player development, again, is going to be very important for especially younger players. It's a great way, one, uh, to make connections with the players. It's a great way if you're thinking about coming to the United States, maybe the college basketball or into the G League, uh, to see if you can get your coaching career started over here. If you're able to develop and work out players, it's a huge, huge credit to yourself, and you're going to be very valuable to whoever is the head coach. And again, it goes back to some philosophy things of what you can believe in. And for me, again, I got very lucky because the players I ended up having a chance to develop, they were already great. Saul didn't need Scott Roth at the, really at the end of the day. He was already skilled and great when he came from Barcelona. Same with thing with Nowitzki. But um, I managed their way through the season and allowed them to, again, back to video teaching them who they were playing against. Uh, I believe, you know, with these post players that you need a go-to move and you need a counter move. You don't need anything more than that. Um, the great players have two moves that's unstoppable. I don't care if you're a point guard or a wing or a center. What's your go-to move? And make that great. And so I helped them develop go-to moves. And then once they got really, really good and started commanding double teams or commanding more attention, Then they needed one counter, one other move that would allow them to score also. And so I kept things very simple with a lot of these guys uh, across the board. And I was lucky to have a talent. And I have, again, uh, you know, this sheet, obviously, of the, uh, of, the, of the drills. I have the same thing for the big men. I have X amount of drills uh, that I use. I uh, wish I could show you some. Uh, We can't, but I have those drills, and I go over and over and over again with them. Uh, but the biggest thing is to be a true player. You have to tell them the truth. They have to believe in you. You have to know what you're doing. You have to be prepared. Uh, you can't lie to a player. They're smart. They're going to figure things out. They're going to know if you really have their best interest involved in them. And you have to be a truth sayer. You have to tell them the truth of where they're at, what they're doing, and you have to be able to back that up by your prep, you being prepared, uh, you giving them uh, moments of success that if something happens in the game, I think we worked on that. 
not bad. Or I saw that in video, coach is right. So all the things, again, goes back to your philosophy. What are your drills, your core drills that you like to use? And then that, again, grows, um, like, uh, uh, like we talked about before, they'll grow over time. You'll keep adding things that you see that you like or don't like. Um, I think the big thing, going back to the coaching philosophy defense and the drills with the bigs, is a lot of coaches just do drills. On YouTube, they do whatever. They just do a drill. But the drill has to have some purpose. It has to be game-like. It has to be real. It has to be something that's going to work in a game. It has to be at that speed, uh, whether it's a drill for a player or it's your four-on-four four shell drill. It has to be realistic, and it has to be something that's doing it to hold the players uh, and continually stress your philosophy, your belief. I'm accountable. And you can't be just jumping all over the place and seeing something over here and use it one day and then never use it again. I like this drill, but it doesn't mean anything, but players are running around. It's got to be structured. It's got to be something that, Again, you're comfortable teaching. Um, I had a I, he's on the line right now, Ryan Marchand. Uh, you know, I had him as my assistant coach uh, in Iowa for two years, and you know, Ryan is five foot seven, but he can work out a big guy or he can work out a guard. Uh, he has a skill level to do both, and he's one of the reasons why uh, I brought him on board when I was hiring my staff in Iowa. Is um, he had the ability to work out players right away. I didn't so know so much about him early on about his coaching, but I knew one thing. He was able to work out players, and he ended up working out the players for Tofosh, uh, I believe, what, three years ago, Ryan, or four years ago, uh, for Tolga Ongren uh, and his team uh, when they came out to Thousand Oaks. Um, he was the guy that worked out the players for Tofosh, and I hired him because he could work out players and was smart and could develop bigs, wings, and guards. And so I think it's really important that you have that skill set, especially if you're a little bit younger, to be able to go between players, sizes, and not be pigeonholed. I'm just a big guy. I'm just going to work out big guys. I was lucky enough. I, I worked out big guys, but I played guard, so I also knew how to work out guards and, and those type of things. But Ryan's a perfect example of a guy that did everything on the workout side of it in the G League and has developed a very good reputation of being a guy that can work out anybody. So um, player development to me is very huge. It's very important, uh, especially if you have a younger team and you're developing a younger team. And if you have older veteran players, it's important that they're getting the video work, the quality time on the floor with them. Maybe it's not an hour. Maybe it's 20 minutes of just some kind of aspect from your offense or defense that you want to lock into these guys and keep them sharp. But it's important that all coaches are able to get on the floor and actually work with a player. You know, it's no good if you can say a few things and then never get on the floor. The players aren't going to respect that. You got to get on the floor. You got to get. You got to get. You got to get your hands dirty, and you got to actually get out there and do the work. Anyone have any questions on that or anything from there? Uh, could you add? Could you add a little bit about the relationship between assistant coaches and the players, and also the triangle between assistant coach, head coach, and uh, player? Yeah, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, I've been lucky enough to be a head coach, a number one assistant, an assistant, so I kind of understand that. And I also understand, you know, having to deal with a general manager and a, and a president also. So, and then being a player, um, I think the assistant coach role, in my opinion, is to be truthful to the head coach, to be a great sounding board and to have answers and, and to be well prepared on what's going on. Um, most coaches are going to have their ideas of how they want to coach, but the uh, assistant coach has to keep them, you know, keep the head coach um, somewhat accountable um, on the same page. And he has to be a great in between person to the players. So the players are comfortable enough and trust enough that they can vent to them, that they can have um, serious conversations with the assistant coach. Um, and know that it won't go to the head coach. Some things don't go to the head coach. Some things are stayed with that assistant coach. There might be some family matters or whatever, but the player, the, the assistant coach is so critical in, in winning and in developing um, 
a great staff that's working together is on the same page and and um, building those relationships as an assistant coach really can start through player and that's where you get the chance to really get one on one with a player and start to gain the trust of that player and I think it's just hugely important and then uh, your second part of that uh, Marat was the uh, head coach and no, you already you already give the, the, the answer. I asked the head coach, assistant coach, and the, the players, the, the triangle. Yeah. What is yeah. your role I, as an assistant coach? You already yeah. mentioned that. Yeah, and I think I think just to add on to that real quick, Marat, too, is, um, you know, if, if some of you are head coaches and are becoming head coaches, you know, your general manager um, is going to have to be on the same page with you. Uh, you know, I had a chance uh, last month to take a job in Australia. To, uh, by the way, Australia is you know one of the best leagues in the world, in my opinion. It's in the top five leagues in the world. We have great players over there. It's run real well. I had an opportunity to, to get get a job over there before I came home, and I actually turned it down uh, for some other reasons. But if you're not comfortable with the general manager, if you don't have the same vision, and you're just taking a job to take a job, you're going to be in trouble as a coach. And you really have to have some kind of relationship with the general manager and trust that you're going to be on the same page. And that's going to have to end up going up to the president or the ownership group that you guys are on the same page. The only way you win at the end of the day is those three things have to be aligned. Ownership, uh, the general manager, and the coach, there has to be some kind of alignment there uh, to really give yourself the best chance as a head coach to succeed. Uh, if you guys are splintered, and off on different things, it just doesn't work. And I know that most of you already know that. And I also know some of you, and I've done, have taken a job just to take the job and think that you could overcome those things, and, it, and you can't. And it, it becomes difficult. And uh, over the last few years, I've been much more selective in jobs that I've taken uh, that I could control somewhat or that I have relationships with people and not thinking, oh, I'm going to be able to what I need to get done, whether the general manager's on the same page as me or not. We're friends, we're not great friends, or the ownership uh, doesn't you know, necessarily care one way or another. And then all of a sudden they get involved and now you can't coach. They're telling you who to play, who not to play, what guys, what are you doing? So I think it's really important at the end of the day as you start to go through this, I think the resume, the coaching philosophy, all that stuff ties into knowing the general manager and ownership who you are. And do you believe in some of the things that I believe in? And they don't have to, and you can be flexible to change, but when you find the right connection, it's powerful. And you end up staying in a team for quite a, quite a number of years. I, I go back to, you know, uh, Tofash right now with Orhun is up there for like four years now, five years. That's a lifetime for a coach to be in one spot, if you think about it, a lifetime. And there must be some connection with ownership and general managers and assistant coaches for our home to stay there. And those are the, the, the destiny places, the places that you want to be where you can stay and build a career and hopefully have enough luck to be there for four or five years. Um, a great pop of it is to be somewhere 20 years. You know, if you can stay somewhere as a coach for five, six years, you're doing a hell of a job. And that means everyone's kind of on the same page and you're doing the right thing. Uh, the teams that struggle are the teams that are firing people every other month or thinking they're smarter than somebody else. And it's our job as coaches to try to do as much as we can, uh, show them who we are before they hire us. Um, and, and I think some of this stuff, the resume and coaching philosophy allows you to do that. Thank you, Scott. Soru soran var mı? Baya bir saat full konuşturdu. Tolga var mı sorun? Sesin gelmiyor ama şimdi duyabiliyor musun? Evet. Ha, şuna bir sorayım ben. Başka bir şey soracağım ben. <gülüyor> Babacığım nasılsın? İyiyim Scott. Sen nasılsın? <gülüyor> My man. It's really great to have you here. Huh? I mean, what you've been speaking is is something valuable. Really appreciate it. I I wanna I am uh, I believe is I'm a believer of Communication with the new generation. Yes. 
you as a player all around the world, as a coach all around the world, all levels. Now, we have to deal with the kind of generation different than 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Yeah. I think coaches, GMs, assistant coaches, development coaches, they're all, they're all worth it, you know. But yep. how do we convince these young generation, this new generation, to go into our principles, you know, work ethic, right. discipline, and, you know, um, I tell you, in Turkey, if you're a young kid, you play a little bit of ball, they value you as a EuroLeague player or NBA draft player. Right. And after five years, four years, you ended up quitting basketball. So, um, what, is, what is your thoughts on that? Like, okay, communication. What do we have to tell the kids, parents? Most importantly, maybe parents. You know, this is... Not in many states, but in the, over here in Europe, it's a big issue. Okay, what can you say about it? Like communication. Yeah, I mean, it's a great, it's a great question, uh, Tolu. I mean, um, you're basically recruiting, recruiting the the coach. I mean, you're recruiting the player. You're recruiting their family. Um, and I think it goes back to one one of the things I said. You have to be a truth teller. You have to tell them the truth, uh, and you have to have a a, a word uh, that your word is your honor, and that. If I tell you something, I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to do it for your family, for your kid. I'm going to take care of them. Um, I think that that's one of the things that's most important is, you know, I've run across, again, like you said, all different ages. I just came from China, and I had to connect with Chinese players who know no English. And I was able to do that in three or four days because I just told them the truth. When I got to work with them and be around them, I was able to connect with them, and they understood I'm prepared. I'm organized. I know what I'm talking about. And I also understand you. I also stand your generation. Um, I listen to your music. I do some of the things that uh, you like to do. But um, at the end of the day, I'm the coach. And this is professional basketball. And, and this is how we're going to do things. And it goes back to holding them accountable, um, telling them the truth allowing them to always have an open door policy. I know a lot of coaches, um, there's a big separation. And I think that the older coaches maybe today are separated. Like if I have a problem as a player, I can't come and knock on my coach's door. I'm scared of him. I don't want to go talk to him. Yep. In my opinion, my door is always open. If you have yeah. a problem, come talk to me. If you don't know your role, come talk to me. If you don't know why you're here, come talk to me. Uh, we, you might not like what I say, but at the end of the day, I'm going to tell you what I believe in and what the truth is so that we're on the same page to some way. But if I don't have my doors open to you and you have nowhere to communicate it, it becomes very frustrating as a player that my coach doesn't understand me. I can't talk with him. Um, he doesn't talk to me after practice. Uh, I think it's really important that the coach touches Every player, every day. Yeah. Uh, you got to say hello. You got to go shake their hand. You got to ask about their family. You got to ask about what they're doing. Are they married? How's your kids? Is your mom okay? All those things make you human. And if you can't become human to the player, you're going to distance yourself more and more from them. And they're not going to trust you. And they're not going to be around you. And when it comes time and again, when there's a war and you got to win this war during the course of the game, yeah. players are going to play for the guys they love to play for. I love playing for Aydan Sivush. Yes, I, I know. Him during, I hated him. I hated him during practice, but I would fight <laughs> the death with him in a game. And hmm. I think the players have to understand that you got to have that kind of relationship with your coach. And nowadays, you got to be open. Your door's got to be open. You got to be there. You got to be in the gym. You got to spend extra time with them. When practice is over, the coach can't go home. You got to stay yeah. around. You got to see what they're doing. You got to see what they're listening to. What games are they playing? What, yes. What's going on? And um, that's how you build relationships with players and build trust and belief. And if you can't coach, that's one thing. But if players believe in you, you can, you can do a lot of great things by just the belief. Uh, yeah. If you happen to be a great coach and you have the belief, 
then you're you're missing on Abramovich and these guys that are great coaches <laughs> have great teams year after year and they win. Um, obviously, they have great budgets, but they believe in doing the right things. So I think Toga, the biggest thing is you have to have an open door and you have to be invested in the player. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. No problem, Bubba. Yeah. Anything else, Murat? Yeah, one more question from yep. uh, Ankara, Mr. Hayri. Yes, Hayri abi. Teşekkürler. Ses geliyor herhalde Murat. Ses geliyor Merhaba. Murat. Geliyor abi. Merhaba. Peki, hi coach, thank you for your time and valuable uh, sharings with us. Uh, I'd like to ask a question about the new future, about yes. your uh, coaching experience in the 2001 Turkish National. And yes. When there are also two guys here, for Tolga and Murat from that team. Yes. What was your specific role defined over there in terms of the division of labor? Were you the, one of the very first specific uh, defensive coaches of the of the era in Turkey? Were you the first defensive coach in that sense? You know, when I when I came at that time, um, I really came because Ivan Oris was in FS with me, and I obviously knew Toga, and I just had met Murat, and they wanted some people uh, of NBA influence because we had Hido Turkoglu and uh, Mursar Turkjan, and we had some Mehmet Okur, some guys that were in the NBA, and I think it thought that the Federation thought it'd be a good fit that I had played in Turkey, and now I'm coaching in the NBA, that um, I could be a good in-between person for Coach Oris, and the NBA players and just be a relational guy there. Uh, I didn't come with any role as defensive coach or offensive coach. I more came as a consultant just to help them, support them. Um, I will tell you this. I've said this many times. Uh, if I could take my top three or four highlights of my basketball career, it's in the top two of that uh, eight months, uh, that eight weeks that I spent in Turkey. Um, Nothing, nothing uh, can compare to it. Um, the people, uh, the games, by the time we went from Ankara to Istanbul, the whole country was now involved. And it was something that I just, uh, I always cherish and remember. And um, the games were incredible. Uh, the games, we, you know, we won at the end of the games with shots and the fans <laughs> going to the gym. Uh, it, was, it was something that, you know, I'll never ever forget. Um, yeah, it was, it was it was a tremendous t uh, time for Turkish basketball. It still is, obviously, but it was in the top one or two. Uh, probably me making the NBA, which uh, some people never thought I would, and then probably this experience as a coach was uh, something I'll never forget with that time uh, with the players and just, you know, the city. And, man, it was incredible. Actually, incredible time. So how nice then? Hayri abi, tamam mısın? Sesin kesik kesik geliyor. Teşekkür ederim, tamam. Tamam. Ee, galiba başka soru... Teşekkür ederim, sağ ol. Teşekkürler. Ee, Scott abi, e, yes. teşekkür ediyoruz. Çok çok teşekkürler. Stay out at home, stay safe. Yes. Take care Everyone of yourself safe. and your family. Thank you, Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.